Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, Henri Bergson on language today. That's our task. Um, really interesting, actually. There's uh, Bergson has a couple of interesting things to say about language. And uh, I'll divide today's video into two sections. Um, and we'll get into the first one now, the language, the abstract aspect of language. So that one of the, strangely enough, the first abstract aspect of language is, is the practical. Um, and so language has a, an important role. And we've already seen this in prior videos uh, in fixing processes, movements, continuity, perceptions, etc into solid objects. So basically language is, is one of the ways that we take that dynamic continuous whole and break it up into static um, individual discrete objects. It's one of the ways that, it, that the intellect, um, it's one way in which the intellect breaks up that whole into parts, um, which we can then use, right? which we can then manipulate and control and, and work, use in our, in our practical goals. And so that's why it's practical. It's abstract because it's, it's not dealing with that kind of metaphysical reality, which is the continuous whole. It's, uh, so we're, we're abstracting parts of that whole out for practical purposes. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's what I mean when I, I call this the abstract aspect of, of language. But the second abstract aspect of language is the conceptual, which is more what you'd think of um, when, you, when, we, when we use the word abstract. So language also enables the intellect to overcome its initial practical concerns and turn inwards away from matter to recollections, to fleeting images, to the image of the act by which the image is pictured, i.e. to ideas. So it's kind of an interesting, um, it's an interesting way of thinking about this. Language first lets us, it has practical goal, practical usefulness. It lets us take that continuous whole, break it up into things that we can use um, and, and manipulate in order to, to achieve goals. But then at the same time, language then goes kind of beyond that. Um, it, it allows us to, I guess we could say, reify these, reify concepts. It allows us to, to take ideas which are purely abstract, um, purely mental, conceptual, and, and turn them into objects. And then we can kind of operate, not just at the, the level of the practical, using things around us, but now we can also turn, turn our intellect inwards and, uh, and, and um, utilize this conceptual space that, that language lets us, um, gives us access to, I guess, or, or lets arise. Um, so language originally referred to things um, which were out there, right? things that we'd abstracted out already. Uh, and then th those things were covered over by words and concepts and ideas. Uh, and then these concepts and ideas themselves became new things. They became new objects for us, mental objects. Um, and why does that happen? Basically because that is... We're dealing with the intellect here. That's what the intellect does. The intellect can only handle discrete, distinct things, objects, whether they're real objects in the world, whether they're mental objects. That's the only thing the intellect can work with. It can't work with continuity. It can't work with movement, which is, um, which is a process. It can't work with time, duration. Um, and so language lets us kind of get a grip on these things and, um, and, and turn these, these concepts and ideas into mental objects. So those, those are the two ways that language, um, the two astra, abstract aspects of language, the practical in, in the sense that we, um, we label things that are out there, 
things that we, we uh, have taken the continuous whole of reality itself, broken it up into discrete parts, where language puts labels on those, and then that lets us in turn um, control them, manipulate them, use them. And then there's a, an inward turn, which language also facilitates, because this then lets us turn, um, create concepts, which, are, which become in turn new things, mental things, mental objects. So the other aspect of language, which is um, perhaps more interesting, Bergson talks about in Matter and Memory, and that's the rest of the video is, um, is going to be taken from Matter and Memory, but this is language as speech. So basically what language as speech is, it's basically just communication. It's language in its communicative role. So before we looked at it in its... And it's kind of labeling role, the way that it, it lets us identify things, name things, uh, and then turn inwards to concepts and do the same thing there. Now we're talking about communication, real lived um, language, language as it's lived, I guess you could say. Well, that's not quite true. The, the practical is also lived, but language as it's lived in communication, relations with other people. So Bergson notes that it's typically assumed that we match auditory impressions with auditory memories. So we hear the sound um, of the word, <clears throat> and then we match that with the memory we have of that sound, and it's kind of linked to concepts and things, or linked to an object or something. So it's a very kind of mechanistic way of thinking about it. It's kind of, it's the... I guess the scientific model, um, you know, it's a very linear process. One thing causes another. Um, one, you know, one one step, one link in the chain causes the next step, and that causes the next, and so on. So it's a very mechanistic way of thinking about it. Um, but Bergson asks then, if this is true, how can we match the correct memory if we haven't already recognised the word? So if there is no recognition already, which is what the theory suggests, we're just we're hearing the, the sound and then matching it to our memory to get meaning, to recognize it. But Bergson's saying, well, if, if um, in order to match that sound to the memory, we have to have already recognized it. It has to already be different from other sounds, different from other auditory memories. So something's not right in this process. And if you remember... We talked. To, we discussed the exact same objection with perception, the exact same thing. When we when we perceive something, um, the mechanistic model doesn't work because again that assumes that there's this linear process, cause and effect. But in order to match the perception to the object perceived to the object in memory, we already have to have recognised. The object. So some, again, something's wrong, and we're going to see that this this whole uh, the rest of this video just follows kind of in parallel with the same with what we looked at with perception and, and recognition, um, and primarily visual perception at that at that point. A few this was a few videos back. So Bergson asks, what is speech then? <clears throat> so association associationism that the, the the first model that, that Bergson always pulls up. This is based on mechanical contiguity. We talked about this just before. You've got that auditory perception, the, um, the, the sound of the word, that links to memories of that sound and those linked to ideas. And all of this requires that memories are stored in the brain, that sensory stimulation awakens them somehow, and that ideas are then somehow evoked. So there's a lot of somehows in this. There's a lot of, um, for, for a process that's supposed to be mechanical, um, there's a lot that, that just doesn't, isn't explained here. Uh, and I, I've, I've isolated four problems with this. The first is the reasonableness problem. It just, it does, this isn't how it seems we recognize words. 
when we're when we're speaking, when we're listening to other people. This is not the process that um, we intuitively think is going on. I don't think this matches our actual experience. So that's the first thing we can raise: is this is is this a good fit for how we actually recognize speech? It's a great fit for how a computer would, or or a robot would, right? Because they've got no other no no other way to do it. It must be mechanical. It must be you know, a cause and effect chain. But that doesn't seem the way that we do it. So I think there's a reasonableness question here. The second problem is that no two words are ever pronounced the same, even by the same speaker. So when you hear a word pronounced, um, or you've got the word stored in your memory, pronounced a certain way, you hear that word spoken again, and you're able to link the, the new impression, the new auditory impression, to that old memory, um, even though the two sounds are not the same. They're not pronounced the same way. But, and yet we do this effortlessly. There's absolutely no... Whether the, you know, and the words could be quite different. Um, just thinking about different dialects of English, you know, we can, we can still recognize words that, that actually are unrecognizable. And if, you, if you've ever spent any time teaching uh, English as a second language, you'll know that um, slight differences in, in intonation and pronunciation can render the word completely unintelligible to a, a second language speaker. So we, we do this without any problems. Uh, and that this is, is something that's, that's not addressed by this associationist model. The third problem, <clears throat> we never hear single isolated words in speech. And this is, again, something that we don't think about. Right? We, we tend to think it's, it's, it's there's like a one-to-one -one relation. We're, we're taking these words one by one as they come in, matching them, putting them together and getting getting these meanings. But Bergson points out, and he's dead right, that's not what's going on when we listen, when we hear speech. We don't, there isn't a one-to-one -one matching. We never hear single words in isolation. Words always come in, uh, in a sentence, and that sentence comes in a context, in a wider context, in the topic that we're talking about. So, it's um that there's a we're kind of moving towards a holistic understanding of speech and and our recognition of speech we never hear discrete words which we pull out one by one and then have to kind of fit back into the into the whole um and and we'll come back to this later but but that that's a third problem we can note here we never hear these words one by one in speech the words, if we were, uh, we'd never be able to understand anything because speech happens so quickly. You know, it happens quite literally without thought. We understand, we recognize words, we recognize speech without thinking. Uh, and if we had to match each word as a discrete entity, um, I think communication would be impossible. And the fourth problem, it requires that the brain store memories. We've already... I've already um, ranted and raved about that, uh, the brain not being able to store memories, not being a storage um, a storage bin for memories. So that's the fourth problem. <clears throat> so how does Bergson approach this? He has what he calls the motor diagram. And the, basically what his motor diagram is, it's not a diagram, it's... it's uh, it's not an actual diagram in the book. It's just his kind of his outline, his, his model for how speech, how we recognize speech. So he says auditory impression, impressions suggest nascent movements capable of scanning the phrase and emphasizing its main articulations. And that is the motor diagram. So it's and you remember the parrot. This is a, this is in direct parallel with what we said earlier about perception a few videos back. Um, there's These impressions suggest nascent movements or virtual movements 
um, which scan the phrase and emphasize its main articulation. So they, we don't, we don't listen one by one. We don't catch words as they come, as they're, as they're thrown at us by the, the speaker. We, we, um, th there's a movement, there's a, there's a body involvement here. So the body's involved in, in listening and in speech. And, um, and what those movements do, subtle movements, virtual movements, and that we're not actually moving, we don't actually have to move, but there's, there's the, the hint of a, of a movement being suggested. And though that hint scans that, scans the phrase and emphasizes the main points. So we get, um, a more, what, what, what's happening here is we are, um, we're kind of feeling the language, we're kind of feeling the the ideas that the uh, the other party is trying to communicate to us. It's not a case of it's not a robotic style one to one correlation words with with meanings that we then piece together. We're we're kind of immersing ourselves in that speech in a bodily way. Even I mean it's not. We're not we're not directly moving, but but the the words suggest nascent movements. They suggest ways in which um, we can act, and this is everything comes back to the body for Bergson. So I think it would be fair to say, without the body, we wouldn't be able to perceive. We wouldn't be able to speak. We wouldn't, and it's not just because we wouldn't have mouths, but because um, the body is our way of of um, gearing into the world, gearing into language, gearing into our perceptions of objects. That's our first point of contact. That's our first way of understanding is to move. And even, even if that movement is only suggested, even if it's only a nascent movement, it's, that's the first, that's our first point of contact. Uh, and it's that which kind of opens the door to meaning, to significance, to, to recognition. So if this is true, the motor diagram is true, then understanding a new language would consist neither in modifying the crude sound nor in supplementing the sounds with memories. It would be to coordinate the motor tendencies of the muscular apparatus of the voice to the impressions of the ear. It would be to perfect the motor accompaniment. And that's exactly what I was just talking about there, that motor, uh, those nascent movements that we're, we're fully locked into the body here. So speech is felt in the body first. It's a, a motor sympathy or harmony between the ear and the voice, the, the way that we articulate words. Um, the, the muscles involved in that. So again, just fully in the body. This is not a mental operation. It's not, we're not consciousness, consciousnesses detached from the world, um, you know, trying to access it from, from some ephemeral um, mental realm. We're fully thrust into the world, and, and this is the only way we can understand our, our experience. Uh, it might seem kind of far-fetched. It might sound far-fetched at first, this notion that... Um, yeah, the impressions of the ear, the kind of um, the, the movements that they trigger in the body create some kind of sympathy or, or resonance with muscular apparatus in the, in the voice. Um, it may sound far-fetched, but I think that this does... Um, it, tap, it does tap into the way we feel that we speak. When I, when I, when I feel, when I think about how I, I speak and how I hear um, language spoken to me, it's not, a, it's not a robotic thing. It's not discreet. I'm not picking out words. It's more of fully um, immersing myself in that language. And in fact, if I try to step out and step back from it and analyze it, um, you know, word by word, or then, then I'm, I'm pulling myself out of the conversation and I, and it's an effort to get back into it. The, the only way that 
I can really engage in a conversation is to just throw myself in, to stop thinking about it, to stop trying to analyze it. As soon as you do that, um, you, you create a barrier between you and the speaker. Um, and this, I think, again, in keeping with Bergson's idea of the body being so central here, um, I think it's uh, there's more going for this than um, that it might seem at first. That there's there's a real motor connection here, uh, and it's very physical. It's very bodily centric. Um, so we we tend to attribute language to the intellect. Right? We tend to to um, like like the associationist model goes. You know, um, we hear sounds. We we link them to memories. Um, and those memories are linked to concepts, and it's all very intellectual and abstract. But I don't think this is this is actually how we we. It's not how we learn language first. It's not it's not how we learn our mother tongues at, at at any rate, right? No no child learns how to speak by linking sounds with with concepts or ideas because they have no concepts or ideas. So. We have to think about how how it is children learn to speak, and I think it, it's it's not too far fetched to suggest that it is very physical. It's very bodily oriented. They hear the uh, the sound, and then they they they're taught what to what to say in response to that sound. So it's it's they're not linking concepts. They're not understanding at first that you know this gre a greeting requires you to 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 greet to, to provide a greeting yourself all they know is that sound triggers this response uh, and that's their first point of contact with language and that so that's a very um it's 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 purely bodily it's it's like you know coming into the ear and and just it's, there's, a, there's a triggering mechanism, which um, produces the output, and so it's 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 felt in the body that that's the the child's first um, engagement with language. Uh, the intellect is, however, prominent in the way we learn a second language, so that I think. Um, accounts for, for our biases when we think about language and, and speech. Um, because we are taking sounds and matching them to concepts, which we already have. But even in, in learning a second language, um, if you never progress past that, that stage, you never get to real communication. You're able to match match words and and with with um, with ideas and you know you can connect words in that language with this language um, but you never really get true communication and um, as as a English teacher in, in South Korea I've seen that um, you know it's 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 there's there's a big difference between someone who knows the words of a language who's learnt kind of intellectually what to what a language is, but can't communicate. Um, and uh, and the same thing with when, when I learned Korean. I mean, I'm not fluent, but but I'm able to have a conversation. And when I'm when I'm having a conversation in Korean, it's not it's the same as when I'm having a conversation in, in English. There's no, I'm not translating stuff. You know, it doesn't come into me in Korean, and I translate in my head. What do I say in English? Translate that, and then spit it back out. It has to be more intuitive than that, uh, or this you, you just you you can't communicate. There has to be a point at which you kind of get out of the way of the language and let the language work through your body in a, in, in a sense. Um, okay, so that's the motor the motor diagram. Um, the body is is the main. Um, vehicle for this and we, we the goal or the, the the way that we recognize speech the way that we communicate is through perfecting this motor accompaniment so we're we're um, thoroughly grounded in the body 
And uh, I've just got another quote here um, to hopefully stimulate us to think about what happens when we actually listen to someone speak. Do we passively wait for the impressions to go in search of their images? Do we not rather feel that we are adopting a certain disposition which varies with our interlocutor, with the language he speaks, with the nature of the ideas which he expresses, and varies above all with the general movement of his phrase, as though we were choosing the key in which our own intellect is called upon to play? So that's a really nice, um, a nice quote there, capturing that idea. Um, you know, we, we, we're adopting a certain disposition with regard to our inter interlocutor. We are, we, we're kind of blending, matching their, their, their speech, their, their intonation, their gestures. We, we enter, we have to kind of sync up with them. We have to match the key that our intellect's going to play um, in order to have this conversation. Again, very, really bodily imagery that Bergson evokes. Um, because again, that, that's the way that, that uh, the motor diagram works. It's, and, and it's the way that we are fundamentally engaged. We're not abstract, removed, detached consciousnesses engaging from a distance. We are fundamentally bodily. Movement is, is primary. Um, action is primary. Everything comes from that. Everything stems from that. Um, so it's a nice way of describing speech and, and, and um, communication. It's not quantitative. It's not measurable. It's not logical or analytical. It's very, it's a felt kind of um, process. And I, I like that expression, choosing the key in which our own intellect is called upon to play, as if we are we are entering a, a dance or a, a song. You know, we have to we have to blend with the interlocutor, with the, the person that, that, to whom we're we're listening. Um, and this links us back again to perception. We talked about in perception the. Uh, Attunement, I called it attunement, it's not Bergson's word, but the attunement is in those nascent movements which allow us to recognize objects and perception. Um, same thing comes up here. We are, we, we are attuning our bodies in response to these, the ideas, the, the, the words of this person. And, um, Merleau-Ponty picks up on this quite a lot and, and carries carries through these ideas, particularly in the prose of the world, which I'm, I'm just working my way through now. Uh, and I, I, I'd really like to do a video on this at some stage, way, way, way in the in the distant future, probably, if I ever finish this Bergson series. Um, but yeah, so really uh, cool. So that's a nice way of thinking about it, the motor diagram. And there's evidence for the motor diagram, Bergson um, notes, in aphasia, where subjects have lost spontaneous speech, but can still repeat what is said to them. So they've lost the ability to, to um, generate spontaneous speech, but they're still able to repeat words. So there's no problem with that um, th uh, on the associationist model, there's no explanation for this. It, all of the pieces are still there, but they're just, for some reason, they're unable to tap into, they're unable to gear themselves into a conversation. And, um, and that is what Bergson's motor diagram explains. And the same thing with word deafness, which is a, a condition in which subjects retain auditory memory of words, but recognize nothing which is said to them. Again, very difficult to explain this, I think, on a mechanical um, model, but with Bergson's motor diagram, we can see what's, what's lacking is not a step in a process. It's not a link in a chain. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental way of engaging with the, the speaker. It's a way of engaging with the world 
which which kicks off everything, which lets everything else come afterwards. And if you lose that, then you lose this, um, then everything else goes with it. Uh, so Bergson's motor diagram explains that in a way that, that associationism doesn't. And I just wanted to spend, even though I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times already, um, take a moment to drill down a little bit on this comparison with perception, because we did cover perception in quite a bit of detail, and um, and this is really just the same thing. It's, it's auditory perception, essentially. Uh, but in the same way that vision placed us in objects, remember that we weren't creating images, mental images or anything. We were literally in the objects themselves. And the nascent movements marked out that field, we called it, or Bergson calls it, a field into which memories that fit that field, that fit the contours, the, the broad outlines of that field flow. And, uh, and I call this a bodily attunement. You, you get a, a kind of sense from the objects and your memories are able to, to flow into that, coming to overlay the image. Um, in that we looked at that reflective perception diagram where the memories kind of build up around the image and, and we can move further back and, and, uh, or deeper into our memories and, and access more more rich and more varied um, nuances in the memories to, to to get the the connection, the link that we were looking that we're looking for. Um, the same thing happens in speech. Nascent movements in this motor diagram establish a similar field, an auditory field, by which the hearer places him or herself in the midst of ideas first, before developing those ideas into memories. So we throw ourselves into, into, the, um, into the ideas first before we, 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 we elicit the memories that, that let us add context to them, to, to add depth to those, um, to those ideas. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a really interesting way of thinking about this and, and the way I just described it there, we place ourselves in the midst of ideas first before developing ideas into memories, which will then overlay the, those crude sounds, um, which are what associationism starts with, which is what like is the trigger for associationism. Um, for us, for Bergson, they are, they're, 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 I mean, they're a trigger as well, but, but not individually, not as discrete things. It's the, the, the nascent movements which they facilitate in us that create this field and let us thrust ourselves into the ideas themselves first. And this makes possible a holistic account of interpersonal relationships rather than a solipsistic or a conflict-driven one. So we, we are... Um, it, it, it lets us kind of um, get into, well, how can I explain that? We, it lets us, um, I guess the, the, what I said before, immerse ourselves in the ideas themselves. Um, and we, we are directly in those ideas. We're not, we're not looking in on them as a spectator. We're not translating what someone's saying to us from a distance. We are, as we saw with, with perception, visual perception, we're thrust into the object. Same thing here. We are thoroughly immersed in, in, the, in the, the speech, in the ideas that are being communicated to us, which isn't to say that we have the exact same ideas that our interlocutor does. We don't see things in exactly the same way. But that's the goal of speech. And if, if we... If we do manage to fit that, to, to find the right key, then we can have that experience. And I'm sure everybody's had that experience of just gelling with someone, you know. You're just perfectly in sync. And, um, and that, that's not going to be, it's not, it's not purely mental. It's not one consciousness 
syncing up with another consciousness, which, which you know, the two consciousnesses both removed, separate from each other, distinct. It is um, two bodies emulating each other. Two, th those nascent movements are just operating in, in exactly the same way, eliciting the same um, the same memories. You know, all of this is 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 working um, in in harmony letting you really connect with the um, with with the speaker uh, and again through through a, a very physical bodily kind of process this motor diagram not not a um, reified intellectual kind of a mental one mind kind of um, reaching out across the void and, and and um, connecting somehow with with another mind. This is all very for Bergson. It, it, everything comes back to the body. The body is what starts us in Bergson, and um, and even things that we we tend to think are intellectual, mental, purely mental, like language, actually has its ground in 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 movement, and uh, even if those movements are nascent movements. They're just kind of virtual. They are movements that are suggested, but which we, we don't need to necessarily follow through with because that's what the brain does. The brain delays, that it sets up a, um, a delay between that, the stimulus and, and the response it lets us choose different, different uh, alternatives. We've talked about that before. Um, so anyway, this means that and these are two central tenets in Bergson's thought. It means that the whole is grasped before the parts. And that's true on so many different levels for so many different things in Bergson. The whole is grasped before the parts, especially uh, when we're talking about here speech. We grasp the, the ideas before we grasp the individual words. Uh, and that's kind of the paradox of speech. Bergson doesn't get into that. Ponti discusses it in The Prose of the World, which is, I, it's just, the the, um, the link between Ponti and, and Bergson is, the links between the two are just so, so clear. Um, it's crazy that he didn't, Ponti didn't kind of recognize this earlier. I, I, I just read actually in, in 1959 in, in some reflections that he wrote, he said, um, and this was, I was kind of pleased to see this. He said, uh, if we'd read Bergson a bit, a bit more carefully, a bit, if we'd engaged with him a bit more um, thoroughly, we would have seen that the things that we were discovering, or ex ex existence philosophy was discovering, or thought it was discovering, had actually already been articulated by Bergson decades prior. So, uh, so that was nice to see that there was... Um, some recognition came kind of later, um, but just it's it's crazy that he didn't see it prior to that. You know, the, the, the way that some of the things just follow directly on from what Bergson wrote about. Um, anyway, funny. So yeah, the whole is grasped before the parts. We we understand, and that applies to everything, but in, in particular to speech, we understand these ideas first. Um, and the other idea is that the whole is a movement that cannot be broken into parts. So the, and all movement is like that. Movement cannot be broken into parts because if you do that, you just end up with two movements. You never, you never get the discrete things that make up the movement, the discrete, um, perhaps locations that make up the movement. And the same with speech. Speech as a whole, it's a movement cannot be broken into parts, into words, into chunks. Uh, you can do that. That's linguistics. But it doesn't tell us anything about speech. It doesn't tell us anything about genuine communication. Uh, so those are two core tenets in Bergson that, that apply pretty much to everything he talks about and apply just as much here when it comes to language. And a very counterintuitive um, Actually, they're really intuitive, but they counter the way that we tend to think about things. We tend to think 
the other way, bottom up, right? It's, we take the words, we put them together, we, we come up with a meaning. Bergson says, no, no, we get the meaning first. We get the ideas first. Then we break down the words and move into kind of a linguistic approach. Uh, but we don't need that in order to have communication, in order to have language. And the same with movement being broken, being unable to be broken into parts. We think everything can be broken into parts. That's that's what the intellect does. But if you do that to movement, um, you just end up with, with two movements. You, you never get anything. You never resolve anything. You never uncover anything about movement itself. Um, crude sounds, auditory images, ideas, these are all separated into distinct things in scientific thought only. When there is, in actuality, no clear division between them. They're all blending into each other, these things. Um, and they're, they're all making a whole, which is speech, which is communication, the conversation. So here's my last quote. Speech can only indicate by a few guideposts placed here and there the chief stages in the movement of thought. That is why I can indeed understand your speech if I start from a thought analogous to your own and follow its windings by the aid of verbal images, which are so many signposts that show me the way from time to time. But I shall never be able to understand it if I start from the verbal images themselves, because between two consecutive verbal images, there is a gulf which no amount of concrete representations can ever fill. For images can never be anything but things. And thought is a movement. Boom. Just he just he just dropped it on us. That was brilliant. Images can never be anything but things. Thought is a movement. Right back to duration. Everything comes back to duration. Um, which you'd expect if 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 you've got a good metaphysical theory. Um, everything has to come back to it, right? Everything has to emerge from it. Um, and, and here it is. Thought is, is a movement. Um, language, speech is a movement. When you, when you understand, um, when you listen to speech, you start from, you, you engage with the thoughts, with the ideas, the meanings of the, of the, uh, your interlocutor and and you're able to follow because you're following that um you're following the signposts which which are the verbal signposts but they are nothing more than signposts that kind of lead you on the way they're not they don't comprise the uh the path which you're following they're nothing more than markers here and there to keep you on track uh, and the important thing is, is it's a, it's a more, um, I guess, like a felt intuitive process. And that is, I think, what a conversation really is like. I've said this how many times in this video, that is what a conversation is like. It's not like, um, you know, picking up on individual words. It's like following your interlocutor down down the path that they're taking you. It's matching yourself, your um, matching your understandings to your to your interlocutor's speech, matching those keys, getting your key, uh, getting the right key. Uh, cool, and that's about it. That is about it. So that's language for us. Let's have a look at a summary. So first we looked at the abstract aspect of language, and there were two parts to this. The practical, which is how we, we label things, we name things um, in the world, which which uh, objects in the world which we can use in order to fulfill our practical objectives. And the other was intellectual, conceptual um, ideas, which uh, basically it's an inward turn. Of language so moving turning away from the things out there and setting up these other mental objects which are concepts then we looked at speech the uh, second aspect of language and here we had 
We started with the motor diagram, which just puts us right back in the center of our bodies. Uh, and the motor diagram was basically the, the, the idea that there's a motor accompaniment between the ear and the, the muscles of the throat. So the muscles of the voice. And, um, and it's this which is primary. This is, this is the movement that's set up. When you hear that sound, the movement that, that's generated um, almost instinctively is is the one that um, it's a it's 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 a muscular one. It's, it's rooted in your body. That that's the first thing that happens. But it's a nascent movement. It hasn't happened yet, and we're able to, thanks to the brain, we're able to delay that movement and survey our options and choose other options. But that's the fundamental engagement. That's what lets us. It's what it's what gives us the field in which we know. Um, in, in which we can we can um, narrow down the ideas which uh, which our interlocutor is talking about. Afa we looked at the way that aphasia and word deafness both lend support to Bergson's motor diagram, and then we talked about interpersonal relationships. We talked about, did I say? We talked about interpersonal relationships, um, and so that communication is about harmonizing with the speaker. That nice. Uh, image of choosing a key in a melody, choosing a key to match, to fit with what um, what your speaker's saying. And there were two key ideas that cropped up in here, uh, which are central in everything that Bergson talks about. The whole is grasped before the parts. And the second one, the whole is a movement that cannot be broken into parts. And that's that. That's language. Uh, real, it's a really interesting way of thinking about language, especially speech. Um, it's uh, as you would expect. It's it's totally not the way we think about it these days. It's not the science. It doesn't doesn't fit in with the scientific, measurable, cause and effect kind of um, models. Um, those models, I think, don't, they just don't, they don't describe actual experience. They're, they describe what would, what, what it would be if, if a, a video camera could speak. That would be what, it, what, it, how it would function. Or a computer. I guess computers can speak. So that, that, that captures how they are operating, not, not how, um, human beings operate, not how human beings experience. Um, and yeah, like I said, Berks, uh, Milo Ponti really picks up on all of this in the prose of the world and talks about the way that, that language is, uh, the way that we, um, how we experience language, how we're able to communicate. He just takes all these ideas and, and runs with them. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, I'm just ranting now. I'm just rambling. Let me finish here. Thanks for listening. I hope that helped. I hope that clarified something. I feel like I rambled a bit in this one. Um, but anyway, let me, let me stop here before I, before I ramble anymore. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you in the next one.